Do you remember the future? That future we used to dream of with flying cars and monorails and clean streets and no potholes. What happened to it? Where is it? I mean, in some respects, we've definitely succeeded. We all have telephones that allow us to talk to anybody on the planet. We have jet airplanes. But in so many others, we've failed. I'd say that any one of us can walk out of this room, down the hall, and at the nearest grocery store, buy vegetables from China and spices from India. And it would probably only cost you about $20, which, at minimum wage, is only a few hours of labor. So we've definitely succeeded in some respects. But in so many others, we've failed. I'd say that on your walk down to the grocery store, you're likely to cross paths with someone asking for money and possibly needing medical and psychological help. So it's amazing that we can provide $2 a pound peppers from Chile, but we have not solved basic problems like homelessness. And we should ask ourselves, if we all agree that homelessness and poverty and crime are bad, and we've been saying this for a long time, why haven't we managed to solve these problems? Because the problems that we've failed to solve are clearly common problems. It's no one specific person's fault. It's not even a political party's fault. It's our fault. It's a communal failure. And I think a lot of it has to come down to creating a productive and constructive conversation amongst people in society and people in society with government. We need to close those feedback loops. So recently, here in Montreal, in the Plateau Montréal, last year, they built a budget simulator. It's basically a website where you, as a citizen, can go and modify the budget. You can increase pothole repairs and decrease library hours. But to submit your budget to the city or to the borough, you need to balance it. And this plays two important roles. First, it educates the citizens about the real cost of services. How much does it cost to fix a pothole? And secondly, it puts the citizen in the same shoes as the public administrator and the elected official who has to balance the budget by law. But most importantly, this creates a new form of dialogue, one centered around facts and mutual respect between the citizen and the government. If we contrast that to an in-person budget consultation where people physically go to a meeting about a project or a budget, maybe a couple dozen of you have been to one of these, those often bring out the most vocal, critical, and engaged people. They all seem to want unicorns and money trees, which unfortunately are in short supply these days. So the question becomes, how do we engage with a single mother of three who has two jobs? Can we reasonably ask her to travel 45 minutes to speak for two minutes during a four-hour town hall meeting? The barrier to engagement for her is simply too high. And this budget simulator is just one example of how we can bring more people into the decision-making process and start to create feedback loops that allow us to communicate with our elected officials and our public services. You see, the private sector, which gets us our iPhones and our $2 peppers from Chile, has a fantastic feedback loop. It's called products. They build something, they try and sell it to you, and if lots of people buy it, they do well, and if no one buys it, they go bankrupt. In government and society in general, we lack the same level of feedback loops. Probably the closest analogy is voting, and we all know how well that works. In fact, many municipal elections here in Montreal and around the world get only 30% participation rate. That's one out of three people, if you want to check my math. So different organizations have proposals to solve this. Uh, nonprofits and governments, they say we need to do more education, we need more awareness, we need to do outreach, we need to instill civic responsibility into people. And even by their own accounts, that will only boost voter participation by two or three or five percent. I'm sorry, that's not acceptable. I personally won't be happy until everyone in this room and everyone watching this video feels that they are able to capable of and have a duty to engage in their communities on a topic that they're passionate about. Not so long ago, <clears throat> we were talking about whether or not women should get the right to vote. 
They only represent half the population. And at the time, a militant feminist, a militant feminist by the name of Emma Goldman, argued that actually, no, women shouldn't get the right to vote. And it's not because they lacked education or intelligence or were too emotional. It was because voting is a distraction from true democracy. So often, people tell me, you know, I voted, I went to the last election, now leave me alone and let me watch television. But voting is not a 20-minute exercise every four years. And everybody says, you know, society is so apathetic, especially the youth. They vote even less than the more elderly folks amongst us. And a lot of people chalk that up to not caring. They think people don't care. And I, I don't think that's true. And most studies have shown that people are apathetic or seem apathetic, not because they don't care, but because they feel they don't have an impact. They say, I tried. I wrote to my MP. I went to a public consultation. I tried to interact with government, and what happened? Nothing. Nothing came of it. And so out of that frustration, they go home and they play video games and they watch TV and they do something that they enjoy. Out of that sense of powerlessness is born apathy. Recently here in Montreal, a high school student was severely beaten. The, the fight, or rather the pounding, was announced in advance by text message. The students at this very typical high school came outside and waited for it to begin. And everyone knew what was going to happen, with the exception of the victim. And when this high school student came outside, he was promptly grabbed by the bully, by the collar, dragged to the middle of a crowd of 50 of his classmates, and punched, and kicked, and beaten, until the bully had shattered his eye socket, and broken his jawbone, and blood had stained the recess floor. And while this was happening, over 50 of his classmates his neighbors, some of his friends, looked on, many of them videotaping it with their phones to upload it to YouTube. And this unbelievable example of apathy happens all the time at schools all around the world. I was picked on at school, called names, pushed around. Surprisingly, talking about democratic reform in grade two is not as popular as you might think. <laughs> And I'm sure many of us here were bullied, or saw it happen, or even participated in it. And in a situation like that, we can blame a few people. We can blame the school for a failure to educate and intervene. We can certainly blame the bully for actually punching and kicking the kid. And we can blame the 50 or so onlookers that didn't do anything. But of course, the blame is not with a single person, it's with the group. It's a collective failure. And we should remember that injustice always starts at a personal level between two people. But it can very, very quickly become institutionalized and grow like a cancer. My Jewish name is Yosef. I'm named after my maternal grandfather, whose name was Joseph. And he was born in 1920 in Poland, southeastern Poland. And by 1939, the situation in Europe, and especially in Poland, had become so bad for Jews that his family decided to give up all their material possessions, get on a boat, and travel to the other side of the world where they didn't speak their language, share their culture, or share their religion, all in the hope of escaping their predicament. Europe's tenuous democracy of the 1920s and 30s completely disintegrated but it didn't fall apart in one night or because of one person. Those feedback loops that are so essential to a strong and robust democracy were methodically taken apart while millions of Europeans and Germans watched on. Cities with 25% Jewish population going into the war came out with almost no Jews in sight. That's one out of four people and they weren't killed by extraterrestrials. They were killed by neighbors, they were denounced by classmates and colleagues. And killing six million people is hard. It's really hard. In fact, the only way you can kill six million people in three years is with computer technology. You have to find them, 
You have to sort them, you have to organize them, you have to transport them, you have to bring them to camps, and then you have to methodically kill them. In fact, computer technology was so important to the Nazis' extermination effort that Thomas Watson, the founder and CEO of IBM Corporation, received the Merit Cross of the German Eagle, a high award in the Nazi regime. So let me be very, very clear. Technology is not our savior. It can be used for good or for bad. And today, we're surrounded by more technology than ever. iPhones, jet airplanes, iPads, fantastic things. But so much of it seems to be used simply for our entertainment. And if all we use our technology and our creativity and our ingenuity for is 3D movies, social check-ins, and never-ending video games, we're not gonna solve poverty. Because those systems are closed. And the only beneficiary of a 3D movie are the people watching it. It doesn't help anybody else. And not only has technology distracted us from improving society and building that world of tomorrow, it's also changed our expectations. When I can pick up my phone and have a video conference call for free with my friend in China, my expectations of what are possible in this world have changed and government has failed to live up to that. When you hit that bureaucratic wall, when you try to interact with government, that adds to your frustration, and it increases apathy. You see, the opposite of war and conflict and violence is not peace. It's constructive dialogue. It's having meaningful conversations in your communities and with your government. So we need to figure out a way to use technology to get us away from entertainment and bad things into a productive system where we can solve so many of those common problems we fail to solve. Because civic engagement's competition, it's not apathy, it's entertainment. And as long as it's easier to come home after a day's work and watch television than it is to get engaged in your community, we're going to fail. And not only does it have to be easier to get engaged, it also has to be more rewarding. You have to feel rewarded for greening your street or balancing the budget or protecting your neighborhood. It, you have to get the same high out of contributing to your community as you do when you hit level 54 magic necromancer orc in World of Warcraft. Not so many Warcraft players here. Um, <laughs> So we need to use technology to make it easy to get engaged and make it rewarding to get engaged. And then the question becomes, okay, great. Once we figure that out, how do we measure for success? How do we know that we're making progress? Again, the private sector has figured this out really well. It's called money. Those products that they sell you, if they make a profit, they do well, and if they don't, they don't do well. How do we measure success in society and in government? And I think the short answer is data. Hard information about the health of our communities, crime rates, sustainable development, balanced budgets. We need government to open up its knowledge about what's happening in society so that citizens can get involved and can understand our problems and can identify solutions. Government should start to make everything available in a digital and open format. Because currently government is stuck in a 20th century mentality, that's what I like to call closed by default. Which means that they only publish information if it's easy, they have to by law, or it's good for marketing and PR purposes. We need to move from a government that's closed by default to one that's open by default, where all non-personal information is proactively published in an open and digital format. And once we've done that, we can start to have a real, meaningful conversation about the problems in society and potential solutions. Because until we do that, we're at different level playing fields, different level playing fields, where government has far more information than the citizens do. But once everybody has access to the same knowledge, we can remove formalities in government and citizen interactions, and we can ask elected officials to enter the fray on equal ground with citizens. And this is starting to happen. Governments around the world are starting to open up their data. And consequently, organizations are popping up using this information to get citizens engaged in their communities, to improve government transparency, and to improve democracy. 
I talked about the budget simulator earlier, and that's done by Open North, a nonprofit organization here in Montreal. But you also have My Society in the United Kingdom and the Sunlight Foundation in the United States that are working to build apps that help people find clean restaurants and safe neighborhoods. They're working with media organizations to expose government contracts and root out corruption. In short, they're laying the foundation for a 21st century democracy. But it's only a start. Yet, it is having an impact. In 2007 in Kenya, there were presidential elections that erupted into ethnic violence. And a group of Kenyan hackers came together and built something called Ushahidi. It's a very simple tool that allows anyone with a mobile phone to text in a report of violence. The server and their system then aggregates that data and displays it on a map. And that allows other citizens to intervene to stop the violence. It allows government to see where problems are breaking out. And it significantly helped reduce the amount of violence after that presidential election. And this tool is open source, it's available to everyone, and it's now being used everywhere from native reserves in Canada to report bad drinking water conditions to the slums of Haiti during the reconstruction efforts after the earthquake. And we can ask ourselves, if everyone has access to a mobile phone and Ushahidi, is genocide and massacre still possible? So we need to spread these tools and this technology from every village in Bangladesh to the Upper East Side of New York. We need to foster constructive dialogue inside these communities and amongst these communities. I talked to you about the budget simulator earlier, and I, I find that a really interesting example, not just because it gets people engaged and creates a new form of dialogue, but because of the information you get out of it. Because people are submitting their budget, they indicate some demographic information, and then we can see priorities and values for all the citizens. We can see profiles of people, families, single people, uh, bikers, and drivers. We can see what they want in their communities. And that's what society is. Society is made up of a huge variety of people with different cultures and heritages and priorities and values. But by structuring the information around costs and hard facts, we can start to make progress. Because we can see items that almost everybody agrees on. I know in the plateau, they found items where over 85% agreed on. And that's the low-hanging fruit that no government official should hesitate to act on. Because if we really want to get our monorails and our flying cars and solve homelessness and solve poverty, we need to reinvent government and we need to reinvent civil society. We need to open up data so that citizens and organizations can build apps and we need to make government more accountable. Fundamentally, we need a new social contract between citizens and between citizens and their governments. Because the next form of democracy is not a new iPhone app. It's a true, deep, and meaningful opening up of government so that everyone can participate. It's a return to the roots of democracy where apathy is the exception and each individual can meaningfully contribute to their communities. Because no matter your interests, whether you're passionate about the environment, national security, your budget, an economy, whether you're left-wing or right-wing, government matters. Our collective decisions matter. They have an impact on your lives, whether you like it or not, <laughs> and they have an impact on your children's lives. And if we really want to solve these problems, we have to change the dialogue. We have to structure around facts. And then we can start to have a meaningful conversation. We need to figure out a way to close those feedback loops, to get people engaged on a regular and frequent basis. Because it is our responsibility, and no one else's, to build that society tomorrow. It's time to upgrade our democracy. Thank you for listening.